Welcome to our webinar on new insights into equine metabolic syndrome and laminitis. This talk is the work of Dr. Molly McHugh, a veterinarian and large animal internist at the University of Minnesota, and is largely based on the research performed by her PhD graduate student, Dr. Nicole Schultz. Today, Dr. Elaine Norton and myself will talk you through important current concepts behind equine metabolic syndrome and laminitis. I am Dr. Jane Manfredi, a veterinarian pursuing my PhD under Dr. Ray Gore at Michigan State University, and I am joined by Elaine Norton, a veterinarian who's pursuing her PhD at the University of Minnesota, advised by Dr. Molly McHugh. Currently, EMS is defined by horses that share similar clinical abnormalities. These include obesity, regional adiposity, such as the crusty neck seen here, hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance, and dyslipidemia. Why is defining EMS important? Equine veterinarians have identified it as a leading risk factor for development of laminitis in the horse. Laminitis is a crippling and thereby life-threatening condition seen more predominantly in the front feet where the tissues that attach the coffin bone of the foot to the hoof wall become separated, allowing the coffin bone to rotate or sink downwards towards the sole, which is immensely painful. In this radiograph, the coffin bone should run parallel to the hoof wall, indicated by this metallic line. And we can see that it has rotated downwards. The horse will often stand camped under as the one here is doing to put more weight on the back feet to take pressure off the front affected feet. About 15 to 20 percent of horses will experience laminitis in their lifetime, so this is a significant condition. There are some similarities between human and equine metabolic syndrome. Both conditions are characterized by obesity, with body mass index, or BMI, or central waist measurements being used in humans, and body condition scores, or BCS, used in the horse. Both exhibit regional fat accumulation or adiposity. In humans, this tends to be central or visceral adiposity around the waist, and horses have excessive adipose storage around the neck, or a crusty neck, as seen in the first image we looked at. Both species exhibit hyperinsulinemia, which is also known as high levels of insulin in the blood, impaired fasting blood glucose, and insulin resistance, which is a lack of response by the cells to the presence of insulin. Hypertension, or high blood pressure, has been documented in horses similarly to humans, we do not routinely measure horses' blood pressures in the field, however, as the equipment is not available to most ambulatory veterinarians. High levels of lipid or fat in the blood, termed dyslipidemia, occurs in both species, which is measured as increased triglycerides and non-esterified fatty acids and low-density lipoproteins. One study would suggest that there are differences in lipoproteins in horses versus humans, but further research is required. Alteration is in adipokines, otherwise known as hormones secreted by fat tissue, have been documented in both humans and horses. Damage to small blood vessels is well documented in humans and has been thought to contribute to the pathophysiology of laminitis in horses. In humans, microvascular damage results in cardiac disease. When specifically looking at the research that has been published in ponies or horses, what do we know about EMS and laminitis? There are three previously published studies that investigate metabolic predisposition to laminitis in ponies by comparing horses which have had a history of founder to those that did not. Six breeds, Morgan, Quarter Horse, Tennessee Walking Horses, Pasifinos, Appaloosas, and Mustangs. It's important to note that some of the main differences in all of these studies exist. The first study, which looked at Welsh ponies, had 160 horses, and the third study compared 80 mixed ponies, whereas the other study was smaller, with a total of 12 horses. The main conclusions from these studies were that insulin resistance, high blood insulin levels, and regional adiposity, for example, crusty necks, were consistently seen in horses with a history of laminitis versus those that did not. In two out of the three studies, the BCS was also higher in affected horses and ponies. Glucose levels were increased in one study, with triglycerides elevated in two, and non-esterified fatty acids, otherwise known as NEFAs, elevated in one. So how does this consistent finding of an increased insulin relate to laminitis risk? In the horse, hyperinsulinemia, which means having abnormally high insulin levels in the bloodstream, has been directly linked to laminitis by studies which involved inducing laminitis in ponies by administering high levels of insulin. Here we can see on the left a microscope slide of normal equine laminar tissue, and on the right from a laminitic horse who was exposed to infusion of high levels of insulin. The fingers are much less distinct with the laminated course because the basement membrane has become disrupted. We now believe high levels of insulin may cause this breakdown. For example, we know laminitis occurs when horses and ponies are grazing less pasture with high non-structural carbohydrate contents, 
as this exacerbates hyperinsulinemia. Insulin and glucose regulation in a horse is very complicated and involves interactions between the brain, liver, pancreas, muscle, and fat. So what happens first? When it comes to insulin resistance, where the body cells become resistant to the effects of insulin and the body produces more insulin to get the same response, and hyperinsulinemia, it isn't always clear which is the cart and which one is the horse. Is insulin resistance driving hyperinsulinemia or is hyperinsulinemia driving insulin resistance? The prevailing thought is that insulin resistance is driving hyperinsulinemia like we discussed in the previous slide. The tissues are more resistant to insulin signal to uptake glucose and therefore the pancreas responds by producing even more insulin to maintain normal blood glucose levels. However, it's impossible that hyperinsulinemia can be both a sequela and a driver of insulin resistance. This has been seen in mice and rat research experiments. The bottom line is, regardless of whether insulin resistance or hyperinsulinemia comes first, we need to keep in mind that the ability of hyperinsulinemia to perpetuate insulin resistance. I find this concept particularly interesting because some of the horses with metabolic syndrome exhibit very high levels of insulin, sometimes 10 to 20 fold higher. So where does this leave us? We have many unanswered questions about equine metabolic syndrome, and there is disagreement between studies. What is the basic criteria for equine metabolic syndrome? And also, how important are environmental factors? I'll address part of the basic criteria question on my next slide. Rather than just using a body condition score, actual measurements of neck circumference, height, girth circumference, and body length, as well as looking at the neck to circumference to height ratio and girth circumference to height ratio, may actually be more precise in characterizing horses with EMS. And this has been done in humans with actual waist abdominal measurements being considered more predictive than overall BMI. The horse neck to height ratio is the closest to the human measurement. But is there a good blood test we can use to diagnose these at-risk animals more precisely? Currently, most veterinarians in the field use fasting blood glucose and insulin samples to look for hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance. These have been shown to miss some at-risk animals, however, and an oral sugar challenge test has been reported to be more reliable to better understand insulin sensitivity. Other things that can be measured to gain some insight are triglycerides, non-esterified fatty acids, and in research settings, the fat hormones leptin and adiponectin. ACTH is often performed to see if a horse has Cushing's disease. Some individual factors that can play a role are the breed, gender, and age, um, as these are all known to affect metabolic measures. There's a question about whether Welsh ponies tend to have higher insulin levels. Also, does obesity and laminitis affect any of these commonly performed tests for equine metabolic syndrome, or can any of these tests better predict the risk for laminitis? Now to address possible environmental factors that can be relevant to equine metabolic syndrome and laminitis. As we talked about before, exposure to lush green grass with a high non-structural carbohydrate content is a risk factor for laminitis. So too could be hay, concentrate, and supplements. Exercise could also be important as it can relate to obesity and muscle utilization of glucose that affects insulin sensitivity. So now I'll turn the talk over to Dr. Elaine Norton, who will explain more in depth regarding possible genetic components of this disease. So as Jane has been explaining, equine metabolic syndrome is a very complex trait with known risk factors such as the environment, including both diet and exercise, and individual risk factors such as breed, gender, and age. However, we still know that there's more risk factors that have not been well described, both on the individual level and at the environmental level. At the individual level, a very large piece of the puzzle that is missing is identifying those genetic risks. So just to start out with some terms and definitions that we are going to be using throughout the rest of this talk, a gene is a unit of DNA that encodes for a protein. An allele is one form of that gene. Each one of us has two copies of a gene, one, two alleles, one inherited from our mother and one from our father. Alleles can contain changes or variations in the way it encodes for a protein, which can affect or alter a trait. A horse's combination of alleles is called its genotype. What we see physically as a result of that genotype is called the phenotype. Genetic traits can either be simple or complex. Most of us learned about simple traits and how they are inherited in high school biology with eye color. 
if your mom and dad both had two copies of a blue eye gene, then you would have inherited blue eyes from your parents. But if your mother had two copies of the brown eye gene and your father had two copies of the blue eye gene, then you would have inherited one brown eye gene and one blue eye gene. But your actual eye color or the phenotype would be brown eyes since brown is dominant and the blue eye gene is recessive. In horses, the chestnut coat color and diseases such as HYPP in quarter horses and skids in Arabians all follow a single gene with a dominant or recessive inheritance. As a complex or multifactorial disease, EMS is not quite as simple. Complex diseases are often polygenic, meaning more than one gene can be causing disease. As Jane explained earlier, insulin and glucose regulation and fat metabolism are very complicated pathways and require a lot of different genes for proper function. Therefore, finding one gene is not likely to explain all of the genetic risk factors. Also, there are environmental influences which are not only acting on the individual, but the genes themselves. Finally, equine metabolic syndrome is considered quantitative, meaning that there's a range of phenotypes from subclinical to mildly affected, to moderately affected, all the way to severely affected. So what our goal is, is to find the combinations of environmental and genetic risk factors that lead to EMS risk. We can visualize this a little easier by looking at a Venn diagram, where the pink circle is the genetic risk factors, and the blue circle is the environmental risk factors with the overlapping region a combination of both the environmental risk and the genetic risk factor that the individual has that puts them at risk of developing EMS. However, once again, it's not as simple as one combination of genetics and environmental risk will fit each individual. As we know, different individuals and breeds of horses have varying risks of developing EMS, which is due to their individual combined influence of genetic and environmental risk factors. For example, in case C is an individual at low risk of developing EMS and the category we want all of our ponies to be in, in which there are very few genetic and very few environmental risks. Case B is the other extreme. This individual has a large amount of genes contributing to high genetic risk, as well as a lot of high risk environmental factors such as exercise, uh, limited exercise, excessive caloric intake, and other environmental factors leading the horse to having a high risk of developing disease. In A and B, both of these horses are at moderate risk of EMS. However, here we can see the environmental management can change an individual's risk. In case A, there are few risk alleles, and we saw with case C, but without proper environmental management, the overall risk is higher. In case C, this individual has a high risk genotype, like case D but with proper environment control, this risk category becomes lower. Dealing with the genetics of complex disease is a lot more complicated than brown eyes versus blue eyes or dominant versus recessive. So how can we identify these genes leading to a higher risk of disease in different breeds? The first concept we've already discussed and that is there can be multiple different risks in modifying alleles contributing to a phenotype. In this diagram, they're represented by A through F. The next concept is that not all of these alleles are present in each breed, or if they are present, they may not have the same effect, something we call penetrance. So in this example, allele A is present in all four breeds, but it's having a larger effect in breed one and three as being shown by the size of the circle. Allele B is present in breeds one, two, and three, but is not having an effect in breed four. So the theory is, is that Morgan's and Welsh ponies, two breeds at a higher risk of developing equine metabolic syndrome, share several of the same risk alleles as varying penetrance, but there will still be alleles present that are unique to each breed. For example, if we use breed two as a representation for risk alleles in Morgan, and breed four as a representation as risk alleles in Welsh ponies, we can see that both breeds share A and C risk alleles, but allele F is only present in Morgan and is having a larger effect 
whereas Welsh ponies have allele E, which is contributing to the largest effect in that breed. These are the type of relationships that we are trying to unravel. An important thing to realize is that these risk alleles remain in the population because they are inherited throughout multiple generations. One way of trying to find these risk alleles is to look at haplotypes present in cases versus controls. Haplotypes are blocks of chromosome which get inherited together. If we look at the top of this diagram, we see long single colored chromosomes. The pink line here on, here on the purple chromosome represents the risk allele that we are trying to uncover. During the production of sperm and eggs, chromosomes are randomly mixed together through recombination. So we can see as we move through the generation, the chromosomes are more divergent due to, to random recombination, but our pink risk allele is still surrounded by smaller versions of the purple chromosome. By identifying these smaller haplotype blocks in cases versus controls, we can help to pinpoint an area where the risk allele is located. One way to find these regions is to by doing a genome-wide association study. This is where we use the genotype of a large group of cases and controls and use statistics to find regions in the genome that are found more in the cases than the controls. The graph at the top of this slide is called a Manhattan plot. Along the x-axis are all 32 equine chromosomes, and the y-axis is the level of genome-wide significance. So the higher the value, the more significant the differences between the cases and the controls. This particular Manhattan plot is for chestnut coat color, and if you remember from earlier in the talk, chestnut coat color is a simple trait. So we get a nice single peak at chromosome three. From here, we can evaluate the genes in this region to try and identify the causative gene. And just as a side note, Dr. McHugh would like you to everyone to know that in this particular picture, the donkey started it. Another approach to evaluating for positive selection is to look at things that have been inherited um, over time. So these are changes that occur in a gene that gives a population an advantage and therefore is repeatedly selected for. Over time, positive selection for the desired allele results in an individual having uniform alleles and phenotypes. One example of this in humans is the ability to digest milk into adulthood. The change in the lactase gene occurred in one European individual, which offered a selective advantage by adding in another food source and was continually selected for, which has resulted in that same allele being present in the majority of the population. Occasionally, an allele which results in what we consider disease was once positively selected for. For metabolic syndrome, the theory is that this allele was selected for as a thrifty genotype when food source was scarce. Now that horses aren't scavenging for feed, the consequence of a thrifty genotype has led to the development of metabolic syndrome. So our next step in the investigation of equine metabolic syndrome in Wilkes ponies is to determine the genetic predisposition to the disease, uncover the me mechanism of insulin regulation and the effects on different tissues, and to understand how all of these risk factors accumulate to make them horses having a higher risk of DMS. Both the University of Minnesota and Michigan State University are collaborating together to try to answer many of these questions. Throughout this summer, we will be working to phenotype and genotype Welsh ponies throughout the United States. We have been thrilled at the response from the Welsh pony community and are looking forward to working with many of you. We will still love additional participants and can work with your farm or your regular veterinarian for sample collection. For more information, please contact Dr. Elaine Norton or Dr. Jane Manfredi for more information. We thank you for your participation, and if you have any questions, again, please feel free to contact either one of us.